Hello, hello, hello. Good morning, everybody. For, this is Tony Kelly from New Style Radio. I'm not a familiar voice on this show, but we opened the program with the late, iconic Bob Marley's One Love. Bob Marley was 75 years of age, had he been alive, um, in February last, last month. Okay? So my name is Tony Kelly. I'm a Diabetes UK community champion and also a patient lead for the National Health Service Birmingham and Solihull Clinical Commissioning Group. And you have the pleasure of my company for the next two hours with some of my l music that I've chosen. So I hope you enjoyed, starting with Bob Marley and uh, six healthcare professionals throughout the two hour slot to talk about diabetes. And I'm just going to give a brief synopsis of what diabetes is. We all have an organ in our body called the pancreas, and the pancreas makes insulin. Now, in type 1, which only 10% of people have type 1, the pancreas shuts down altogether, doesn't work. So you can't produce any insulin, which has helped to regulate the blood, um, or the sh blood glucose sugars, as we call it. And therefore, you have to survive on insulin. That's type 1. And that's nothing to do with diet, nothing to do with ethnicity, lifestyle. Only 10% of people have type 1. Two classic persons in Britain who have it are the former Prime Minister, Theresa May, and Philip Schofield. They both have type 1. 90% of people have type 2. And type 2 is when insulin is being produced, but either not enough or it's not doing its job properly. So over the next two hours, we're going to have a lot of healthcare professionals coming in, talking about their role on the um, insulin diabetes journey. And my first guest I have to welcome, we go back quite a long way, my first guest I'm welcoming today in the studio is from, she's going to talk all about what she does and what she doesn't do. <laughs> I think it's more about what she does, Eleanor McGee. So welcome, Eleanor. It's nice to have you. Thank you, Tony. It's nice to be here. Uh, I have been on New Style before, but not with you. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> There's always a first. <laughs> now I'm going to start, Eleanor, by asking you to explain to the listeners what is your role and function as a dietitian and where exactly do you work? Yes, Tony. So dietitians work to support people to change what they eat towards a healthier eating pattern. That's our role. Normally, we work with people who've got an illness that's affected by diet, so that could be diabetes or heart disease, and there are many, many more, but we won't focus on those today. Sometimes we have roles in health promotion, just trying to get people to eat more healthily to prevent them developing disease. I'm employed by the NHS. Not all dietitians are employed by the NHS. I used to work for Birmingham Community NHS Trust, which was when I first met you, now I'm working at Heartlands Hospital, which is one of several hospitals that come under the umbrella of University Hospitals Birmingham. As you know, the NHS is very confusing, but all you really need to know is that I'm an NHS dietitian, and that binds me to a, a kind of behaviour, makes sure that the advice I'm giving is evidence-based. But we also have a professional code of conduct, so anybody who's a dietitian, you can trust them. People who say they're a nutritionist, you can't be so sure. <laughs> okay, thanks for all of that, Helena. Um, may I take you further? You mentioned hospital settings. Do GP surgeries, and a lot of the p listeners mm -hmm. are, are, are people who are registered with GPs, do GP surgeries and practices have a dietitian as a standard feature within them? They don't, unfortunately. There are many, many fewer dietitians than there are doctors and nurses. You'll notice when people talk about the NHS, they always say doctors and nurses. Occasionally they might mention physios or a few other things, but dietitians are quite small, low in number. So GP practices generally refer people to a dietitian or a dietitian service, and it usually means that people have to travel a little bit further to see a dietitian. So we have clinics across Birmingham in the community, and then there are clinics, outpatient clinics at all the hospitals as well. Um, so where you go will depend a little bit on your GP, but you should be able to have a bit of a say in that as well, where you can travel to. So GPs and practice nurses refer to dietitians. They generally don't have them in their actual building or attached to their practice. Right. And for the listeners, because we're based sort of on the border within the Sandwell Black Country area. Yes. Other um, guests will talk more about what's happening within mm. Sandwell as well. Um, so... 
How are patients, for whatever reason, who need dietary advice referred to people like you in the National Health Service? Can they self-refer or has it got to come from their GP or a diabetic nurse? Um, explain for the view listeners, sure. please. Sure, people can self-refer and to do that you would go on to the website of your nearest hospital or your nearest trust. So Birmingham Community Healthcare Foundation Trust would be one. Um, However, it's usually better if a GP or a practice nurse does the referral because they will include other relevant medical information that the dietitian might want and perhaps some numbers and results of blood tests that would be very useful. So people have got a right to ask to be referred and they, their doctor or their practice nurse should refer them. In general, when people are first diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, that's the one you mentioned that more people have, mm -hmm. they should either see a dietitian one-to-one -one and or be referred to what we call, the, call a structured education program. So in Birmingham, there's a lot of expert, which is a national program. There are courses of that. There's another one called Desmond, and there are various other options, but they're generally all known as a structured education program. They will have dietitians involved and practice nurses, and they will support people to make the dietary change that they may need to when they're diagnosed. Right. And I, I need to come in there, Eleanor, because the word structured education might um, sort of, um, for some people, be, oh, my God, you're sending me back to school, to the classroom or so on. But because I've been involved in the, the setting up and the running of these um, particular um, diabetes awareness sessions is another way of describing them. It's the getting people, especially if they're at risk from type 2, getting the information, the knowledge. Knowledge is power, and that's what that's about. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and I, I think you're right. Structured education can sound a bit dull, a bit schooly, a bit being preached at, mm -hmm. and actually that's not how they run. They tend to be interactive. You can ask questions. You can get some individual advice. Mm -hmm. They don't depend on people having a high level of reading and writing because that's obviously that can be a barrier for some people. Thanks for that, Elena. Um, uh, can I move on a bit and ask you, what is your advice um, about all the fads and diets that you see the public being bombarded with um, on various television channels, on the radio, um, in newspapers, in glossy magazines? Give the listeners some advice about all these fads and diets that they want us to go on or not go on or what have you. I think fad is the word, Tony. Generally, they are fads, and we <laughs> would prefer that these things weren't out there because it's very confusing Using. for people. Most members of the population think that nutrition professionals and dietitians are changing their minds all the time, and we're not. The basic messages about a healthy diet and a healthy diet for type 2 diabetes have not changed much since the 1980s. Mm -hmm. We advise regular meals, whole grain starchy carbohydrate where possible, so that's things like whole grain bread, pasta, brown rice, uh, lots of fruit and vegetables, that's probably the most important message, olive oil, small portions of protein food, by that I mean chicken, fish, particularly oily fish. Um, so um, that, that diet, based on whole grains, chicken and fish, plenty of fruit and vegetables, tomatoes, olive oil, can actually lower your risk of developing diabetes or of dying from heart disease or developing heart disease. Even if you don't lose any weight, it's really, there's really a lot of evidence around it. Particularly good vegetables are things like garlic, onions and leeks, as okay. well as tomatoes. And fruit is included. We often find that people with diabetes are very fearful about eating fruit. Yes. These are all the things that I and my family do eat in, in great portions, the, the things you mentioned. Thanks for that, Eleanor. Uh, now, social prescribing is the new buzzword, and I'm going to explain to my listeners what social prescribing is. Instead of going down the route of medication for some of the complications from diabetes and for other ailments, etc., um, People are more inclined, GPs are more inclined to say, well, join a gym or do some physical activity or join a dancing club or an aerobics club or swimming or aquarobics or so on. Um, what, what's your view on social prescribing? Um, I think social prescribing is a very good thing. However, I think in a way it's a pity that we need it. It's really come about because we don't have strong communities anymore, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. People can be very isolated. 
and the evidence shows that people are healthier, their health and well-being are better if they connect with other people, if they learn, if they engage. So social prescribing can do all the things you mentioned, but it can also send someone to a knit and natter group or to, to do something creative. Right. And all those do help our health, lower our blood pressure, keep us healthy and well mm. for longer. Years ago, we had adult education that did mm -hmm. that, but that has mainly been cut by the government. Mm -hmm. And also, as I mentioned, people had stronger community. Right. Now, with everybody having to work so hard to pay their rent or their mortgage, there's less time to be nice to your neighbor. And yes. we know that social isolation and loneliness are big issues. Absolutely. So social prescribing is a good thing. As I say, I think it's probably a pity that we need it, but at least people can be signposted. They can be taken to the first session if they're feeling very nervous about it. So it is a very good thing, and we have got it in Birmingham. Well, well done. Um, my next question to you, Eleanor, as a dietitian, are you an advocate for medical drugs in order for the public to be kept healthy? Now, that's a very It's a difficult question, one. yes. Uh, drugs are needed, I have no doubt about that. However, there are ways of avoiding having drugs, and if you can stay active, stay healthy, eat, as I say, what we call the Mediterranean diet, plenty of fruit and veg, whole grains, small amounts of fish and chicken, then um, you can put off having drugs. By older age, most people are on some drug or other. But a good example of where you can avoid medication would be with diabetes or high blood pressure. If you're told that you've got pre-diabetes, mm -hmm. that means you're at high risk of developing it, or that your blood pressure is on the cusp of needing medication, you can ask your GP to leave it, don't prescribe anything, and you go away and you gradually increase your physical activity, you change what you're eating, go back in a month, two months, three months, and get your, your blood tests done again, and you may find that you've managed to stave it off. Absolutely, I agree with that. Enable and empower the patient to make the lifestyle changes, behavioural changes. And I think people don't realise GPs are trying to be helpful and they're very short of time. So mm -hmm. as they reach for the prescription pad, or in nowadays it's the keyboard, mm -hmm. it is possible to say, doctor, is there anything else I could Can try? Do. Doctor, mm -hmm. could we try something else for three months? Can I come back and see you when I've yes. tried to be more active, when I've tried to improve my lifestyle? Uh, yes, I, I like that. And, and I hope the listeners have heard that loud and clear. Um, the next question I have here for you is, what thoughts do you have? You've sort of touched on it in, in, in what you've said so far in terms of physical activity. And notice I did not use the word exercise because exercise conjures up for me and for a lot of people that you're saying to the person, go to the gym. So physical activity, what, what benefits mm -hmm. are there from doing that? I'm with you, Tony. I've never been to a gym in my life, but I consider myself <laughs> you look physically so active. <laughs> yes, I walk. Sometimes I swim, I dance. And I think... Um, the biggest health benefit, the evidence tells us, is moving from being inactive to being active. Absolutely. So what I say to my patients is, you need to be the kind of person who will get up and go back upstairs if you've forgotten something. Mm -hmm. Don't think, I'll do without it because I'm down here now. If you can't get out of the house, and some people can't, just going up and down stairs is good if you have stairs. Mm -hmm. If you're really limited in your physical movement that you can do, sit to stand several times a day is a good start. You can do that first of all in a chair with arms and then as your mu muscles in your legs strengthen you can do it in a chair without. Then you could try walking around the garden or to the front gate. Um, you may need to do that with somebody if you're nervous or unsteady on your feet. Build it up gradually. The key is making small changes. Nobody goes from zero to incredibly fit. Yes. And you will just put yourself off and hurt yourself if you try and do that. Yes. Um, so I suggest to patients some outdoor activity of at all possible because we know that being outdoors is good for mental well-being. Indeed. So a five-minute walk, build it up to a 10-minute walk. It can be really good. We have fantastic parks in Birmingham. If you can get to the park and do the same walk every day, okay. and then you begin to miss it because you see the seasons, you see the changes, you feel good about it. And then when you don't do your walk, you'll think, hey, I need to get back and see how the primroses are doing in Summerfield indeed, Park or whatever indeed, it is. Indeed. And rather than exercise being a negative, a punishment, mm. we need to see it as a positive, positive. enjoyable thing uh, in life. And it, as you say, it's being active. It's not being super fit, going to the yes. gym, mm -hmm. breaking into a sweat and wearing yourself out and giving yourself aches right. and pains. Getting those heart muscles pumping. Exactly. Yes. Uh, one constantly, Eleanor, here, here's the term, um, smaller portion sizes, um, less is more and moderation in all things. 
what's your take on, on, on those terms? Yeah, um, moderation and smaller portion sizes are definitely messages we need to get across. Mm -hmm. I sometimes ask people, how big is your dinner plate? Is it bigger than the dinner plate you had when you grew up? Is it bigger than the dinner plates your parents had? And it nearly always is. We have supersized everything and there's a drive from the food industry to do that. If you eat out, you get extra for the same price and we somehow feel we have to do that to get value for money at the detriment of our health. Children eat the same portion sizes as their parents. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. Yes, they yes. don't need all those calories. That's why childhood obesity is a, an issue for concern. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. it can help as a trigger to eat less if you use a smaller plate. Mm -hmm. So use a smaller plate and don't just pile on extra, but make sure that you use that plate as a trigger to eat less. The mm -hmm. truth is we will all put on weight over the life course if we don't take steps, steps not to. Indeed. So indeed. smaller portions, moderation. I would never say give up anything except perhaps fizzy drinks. I can find nothing good to say about those. But all other Ten food, out of ten for that <laughs> one. <laughs> all other food can be eaten in moderation. Mm. Right. Um, we're coming to the end. It's, it's very interesting what you've said so far. We have a number of other speakers. The, the listeners will hear them too, saying all sorts of things about diabetes. That's what the, the special topic is today. Um, I clearly remember, Eleanor, um, during one of my diabetes awareness sessions out there in the community, a black woman actually came up to me and said, her dietitian said she must stop eating all, the operative word being all, West Indian food. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that as a dietitian? That was a very wrong thing to say. Um, I very much hope that it wasn't a dietitian because dietitians should be trained not to do that. It could have been a practice nurse. Sometimes when people are unfamiliar with foods, mm -hmm. they will say don't have that because they don't really understand how to interpret the dietary messages with those foods. Mm -hmm. I met a man from Nigeria once and he'd stopped eating his food, which was based on yam and cassava and started eating chapati because chapati was mentioned in the diet sheet and African traditional food mm -hmm. wasn't. So I would say there can be a problem with a very traditional Caribbean way of eating that needs modification, but mm -hmm. it's not about giving things up. Mm -hmm. I've had patients who will eat a very light breakfast, maybe mm -hmm. a cup of tea and a couple of biscuits, and then a big meal between three and five in the mm -hmm. afternoon. And that meal has got lots of sources of carbohydrates, starchy carbohydrates that so could have yam, rice, green banana, um, something like taro, dasheen as well. Now you may want to try all those foods, but mm -hmm. I would say have the same amount spaced out into three meals over the day. Oh, all right. May, may I also add then that um, what listeners need to hear, we're talking about the African Caribbean community in particular and mm -hmm. the South Asian community, all carbohydrates break down into our system into glucose or sugar. We must never, ever forget that. So when I hear, I go to social media websites and people say, I'm pre-diabetes or I'm borderline or I have it. I've given up sugar. I don't have sugar in my tea or I don't have cakes and biscuits. They need to remember that every single carbohydrate you consume breaks down into your body into glucose or sugar. Is that not correct? That's absolutely right. However, we do tend to find that sugary drinks are a good thing to cut out. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, I'll meet somebody who'll say, I've stopped sugar, I'm having honey. Unfortunately, to your body, honey is just that's sugar just as well. Exactly. But the starchy carbohydrates break down to glucose in the body, and that's why you need them in regular mm -hmm. amounts throughout the day, in moderate amounts. So you need that as well as cutting out some of your sugary, fatty food. Mm -hmm. The only benefit of cutting out your cakes and your biscuits is that those are really empty calories. You don't need those. Mm -hmm. But again, I wouldn't say cut them out altogether. Have them as an occasional treat. Treats, we all yeah. need some food treats. It's just that our only treat shouldn't be food. All right. Eleanor, um, you've given our listeners quite a lot of food for thought, pardon uh -huh. the pun. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I I'd like you to end now by... Uh, wh where can we find information, websites, or contact numbers uh, um, from a dietitian's point of view? Because I'm conscious that we have other listeners yep. lined up, and I also need to play the next yes. track. So. Just very quickly, um, a Caribbean diet often has more vegetables than a t typical British diet. So your callaloo, your carrots, your broccoli is all good. Fruit juice is not ideal. It's better to have your fruit as fruit. Um, a handful is a portion, so one portion at a time. Some good websites are Diabetes UK, which is www.diabetes.org.uk. And there's a section called Diabetes and Me that looks particularly useful. Mm -hmm. 
Then there's the British Dietetic Association, which is www.b4britishdietitiana.com, and there's a section called Food Facts. If people want healthy recipes, there's www.startwell forward slash recipes. That's it. Right. <laughs> now, these are a lot to take in. So I'm going yeah. to ask the New Style Radio team to put all these on their website sure. for future I'll reference. I'll email them to you after Eleanor, this. thanks for coming in. You're my first guest. And, um, um, uh, and what I'm going to do, your name is Eleanor. I'm going to now have a song played called Helena. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm going to explain to the listeners the in significance of this song. Helena, spelled H-E-L-E-N-A. Um, it's a song about surracy. Surracy is a, is a bush that is used in Jamaica. Um, and it's the Jamaica folk singers who I used to sing with back in Jamaica under Dr. Olive Lewin, who um, sung this uh, in their repertoire. And it says here, Jamaica has strong traditions of folk healing by herbs and other means. Here, one of the most potent healing bushes is the subject. Surracy is known in Guyana as Corilla Bush and has recently been the subject of serious scientific research for use in diseases and it goes on to say like diabetes and cancer. I don't really call diabetes a disease but that's for another time. This, the song highlights the danger of careless use of herbs because the young girl obviously does not know surracy. And when instructed by her mother to boil some of the tea for her pains, she picks the deadly nightshade, which Ooh. is poisonous. Let's hear Elena. Birmingham's number one for African arts, culture, and Afro edutainment. edutainment. 98.7 New Style FM. New Style FM. Welcome back to the special feature, Diabetes and Good Health. And uh, you just heard the song, Elena, from the um, Jamaica Folk Singers um, album. Um, talking about surrogacy. Now, next in the studio here, uh, my special guest, and it's a double act. <laughs> <laughs> it's Sergeant Golar and Letitia Brown. And instead of me explaining their titles, I'll ask them to come in. And Sergeant, you will tell us what's your title and, and the meaning of it. What do you do? Mm -hmm. And Letitia, you will also do the same. Welcome to New Cell Radio. Thank you, Tony. Hi, welcome. We're glad to be here, given the opportunity to talk about what we do and what we love doing. My name's Sergit Gola and I work for the Birmingham Solid Holden Screening Programme. My job is to go out into the community or work wherever hospital site we're working at and to do screening. Screening is that we actually take photographs of people at the back of their eye. Okay? There's a whole process to it but we can go into that later. I also do the assessment afterwards as well. So as well as um, doing screening I do the grading as such. The grading is when we assess the patient's um, eye in order to decide whether they need to be put on annual recall or whether they need to have any further sort of um, referral process going on. Thank you for that, Sergit. And Letitia? So I'm Letitia Brown. So I work as a patient engagement lead for the eye screening programme. Um, so we are a screening programme working in Birmingham, Solihull and Black Country. So my main job is to go out into the community and engage with all the different organisations that we work with the programme. Um, a lot of my work at the moment involves meeting with GPs quite regularly and also our CCGs across the programme as well. Um, so at the moment, a lot of work that I'm doing is working closely with our GPs to make sure that we're getting all the patients engaged that we need to um, and make sure that everyone that needs to come in for screening is coming in. Okay, Th thanks for explaining your, your um, respective roles. Um, may, I, may I then just bring in the whole issue of the eye, because we know diabetes impacts and affects the eye in, in a big yeah, way. It does. Uh, and I have been doing this work now as a Diabetes UK Community Champion and also as a NHS Birmingham and Solihull Clinical Commissioning Group patient lead. And there's an issue when I go to a lot of healthcare conferences where I never see opticians at these conferences. This is up and down the country, uh, and I wonder, well, shouldn't they be included? What's your take on that? Why are opticians sort of left on this side or not really part of the whole diabetes program? Why is it not a seamless service um, involving all, all the, the healthcare professionals? 
Oh, we try and include the opticians who work for our service as much That's as possible. That's good to hear. Yeah, mm. but unfortunately, as you know, everyone is busy in their work life. Uh, they have to, as well as include screening in their practices, they do regular eye tests as well. Mm. So sometimes it's not always possible, but they do have a forum where they have a optical lead who joins um, when there's like regular meetings at... Um, where we're based at Heartlands Hospital, mm -hmm. they are they have a representative who's on the council there to mm -hmm. bring his views and to talk about things that are, are c up and coming or any problems that they have. So we they are included, but they're not always not individual opticians, but through a lead. Okay, yeah, so the lead optician. So we have um, a local optometry committee for this area. Mm -hmm. So um, every quarter that person will come to those meetings and feed back to the team so we are quite engaged through that channel with our lead optician mm -hmm. um we can't comment obviously on what else is done in other parts of the country mm -hmm. um but we do have public information available as well mm -hmm. um just to make sure that we're highlighting the importance of getting a regular sight test at an opticians mm -hmm. but also coming in and having a regular diabetic eye screening test right now i hear that loud and clear but uh, the issue i have when i do the training events that i do yeah. people come up to me or even say it out loud in the training event it's not their gp who discovered that they had type 2 diabetes it's mm -hmm. by going for their annual eye review at the optician the optician he or she said I don't like see I don't like what I see at the back of your eyes. You need to go and get a diabetes blood test done yeah. at your GP. And that's coming up to me quite a lot of people saying that it was first diagnosed or not necessarily diagnosed but the the sort of signposting came from yeah. Yeah. from their yeah. annual eye review. And that's the issue that I'm facing out there with people saying, Tony, I had no idea I had this medical condition until it was brought to me at my annual eye review. Now, yeah. that's the worrying thing I'm wanting, which is why I'm saying it probably could be more joined up. Yeah, I mean, that's worrying to us as well, because it's the GP who's supposed to initially diagnose the patient with the diabetes because they have a blood test done there. Mm. I mean, everyone's encouraged nowadays to sort of be in charge of their own health. Mm -hmm. And a lot of GPs uh, do regular um, blood tests in order to screen for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And diabetes, obviously, is something that's screened for quite regularly. Mm -hmm. Or the patient has various signs which they want to address and they want the GP to um, a lot of problems I think stem from the fact that the way the GPs are organized and the way the appointments are given I mean there are issues concerning getting appointments with GPs as well I mean we don't know the full story of mm. it but the process is the GP is the one who diagnoses the condition first yes obviously you're going to get opticians who can sort of identify I changes yes, at yeah, the they back may of the see eye something. But yeah, it be that because a lot of uh, screen, uh, a lot of uh, optometrists now do a form of they take pictures as well. Yeah, they yeah. offer that mm -hmm. as well as uh, yeah. the normal eye test as well. Yeah. But unless they're on our screening program, those pictures we don't see those pictures. All right, but I want to make it um, not sound as if it's all doom and gloom because mm -hmm. we need to recognize that the National Health Service Diabetes Prevention Program, which we're gonna talk about more later, not necessarily you, but one of my other guests, um, in a joint commitment with National Health Service England and Public Health England and Diabetes UK, now have the only one of its programs in, in the world whereby um, they are making efforts to try and prevent diabetes. They have realized that it's an epidemic they are waiting to happen. There are lots of people out there who, uh, whether through obesity and some through lack of physical activity and diet, are developing. So they're pre-diabetes or borderline. Mm -hmm. And this is where the, the National Diabetes Prevention Program has come into the fore and is now happening quite uh, across the entire country. And it's been quite successful in terms of the uptake of people going into groups to look at what they can do in terms of their health, in terms of their physical activity, in terms of the food they're eating and so on. Okay, um, I next had a question to ask you about um, the fact that some people refuse to actually go and get their annual um, digital eye screening. I know the big word for it is diabetic retinopathy screening or 
digital retinopathy screening. For simple language, we refer to it as diabetes eye screening. The listeners yeah. will um, understand that just more. To uh, actually, just to clarify, clarify mm -hmm. it's now called diabetic eye screening. Diabetic eye, eye screening. screening is not, re they don't put retinopathy in there anymore. Just that. Because uh, well, I'm pleased to hear that. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yes. Because yeah. obviously it caused good. a lot of confusion. Uh, that's <laughs> so, good, that's good. But that's, even mm -hmm. now we have, um, if you go into a waiting area and you say, has anybody come for diabetic eye screening? screening. They still get confused about it as well. Right. I've uh. had people say, no, I, want, I don't want an ice cream, thank you. Or is that the wrong thing oh, to Oh, I don't own? want an ice cream. That <laughs> yeah. <they> <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've heard that before, uh, diabetic eye screening. Right, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. All right. yeah, so that's been changed just mm. to clarify or things. Or eye disease, I normally say. Yeah. Um, instead of retinopathy, I'll just speak about diabetic eye disease. Right. Mm -hmm. We are trying to simplify things so that patients yeah. are not scared by the fact. Um, a lot of time, it's because it's fear of the unknown. They, they, uh, and they hear lots of stories. Mm -hmm. They've heard, oh, you know, they put these drops in your eyes and you go blind. But that's not the case at all. That's a myth we need to dispel straight we away. We do, straight uh, away. It's the drops in the eyes. It's any part of this process where they're taking the pictures with the camera. Explain to the listeners, is any of that, I have it done yearly yeah. and I've done for the last 16 years with my type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. Is any of it such that it, it's painful, it hurts? Well, I haven't gone blind in 16 years, so <laughs> that Well, you're a testament that. to our eye screening program anyway, because like it says, you go for it regularly, mm -hmm. your sight is fine, and mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're going back and again and again to have it done because you feel confident to do that, mm -hmm. just uh, to dispel the myth. So. Right. Uh, and what are you saying to the listeners who, and there's some of them who, who out there who have, have diabetes and are still not going to have their check done annually mm -hmm. what would you be saying to them what message would you give them to do to say listen mm -hmm. it's on the nhs it's free what you need to do please basically what you're saying to us as well it's the sooner we get people to engage to come in to have their screening done what we want to say to listeners is you know go out there be in charge of your health be in charge and to look after yourself but give us the opportunity in order to help you you know on this care pathway of looking after your eyes when patients come to us we take the time out we explain the process we say the only part of the screening that's going to hurt is when we put the drops in and that's for about 10 15 seconds at worst it's a bit like getting a bit of soap in your eyes. That, yes, I agree. That, yeah. That's exactly. But the yeah. thing is, soap in, your, soap in your eyes can be. It takes ages to be washed away. Mm -hmm. But this process, the uh, the irritation caused by the drops, only generally speaking, lasts for about maximum thirty seconds. But 10, 15 seconds mm -hmm. is over and done with. So explain to us, the listeners, this issue of blurred vision yeah. and going blind, which is one of the things that happens with people and diabetes. What is it, uh, explaining simple language so that the listeners can understand the importance of taking care of the eyes yeah. in terms of the blurred vision, blindness. Wh what exactly should they be doing or not doing? Just regularly, um, every so often, you know, when you're watching TV, if the, vi if you're the letters that you normally see are blurring, mm -hmm. okay, be aware of it. Uh, go for a regular eye test as well as go for your diabetic eye screening because um, any sudden changes in vision is can be an early indicator that there's ah. something going on at the back of the eye that's why when people come to us for screening we always ask them when was your last screening test when was your regular eye test done and right. you know have one done regularly i mean a lot of optometrists now are saying that they only need to be seen every two years mm -hmm. if your vision is stable they will see you every two years but if you have any problem you can go before then and there are some um, opticians will see, see patients after every year. It, they have a choice. Patients have a choice. What you're looking out for is basically that normally if you're looking at the TV, something looks clear and suddenly it's not looking clear, maybe get that checked out. Okay. Yeah. Now, now you mentioned opticians a lot. Mm -hmm. That would be suggesting you're talking opticians on the high street. Yes. Where do you both come into the equation in terms of the various, tell the listeners about the eye hospitals and the eye clinics that are available that they can also go to. Yeah. When uh, the patient is referred from their GP, they'll be sent a letter of invitation to book an appointment. And on the back of the letter is a choice of various opticians and the hospital where they can get their screening done right so whichever area you're living in there's usually a hospital site 
and opticians, local opticians, who will offer the screening. They've got to be on that list for them to be viable for the diabetic eye screening. Yeah, so that's so what it's only certain accredited optician sites. So across the whole programme, as well as our nine hospital sites, we have a hospital nine hospital sites. Nine hospital yeah. sites. You heard yeah. that, listeners? There are nine <laughs> hospital sites that you can <laughs> go to. We have um, 119 optician sites as well. Right. That doesn't work the same for all screening programmes, but this is just how our local programme works. Works. Uh huh. Okay. Um, there's this myth within the black community, and I'm talking especially the African, Caribbean, Asian community, whereby people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, their eyesight starts to fail them in some regard or they see blurred vision and they just see put it down to old age um yes. <laughs> tell us your take on that try and dispel the myth behind that or is it fact that the older we get then we, we start having blurred vision yes it is a fact that as um it's scientifically been proven that as w after the age of 50, we naturally do get a bit of blurred vision. Our vision changes. Uh -huh. And as we get older, it changes even more. And looking after it is really important. And that's what we try and get to, to our patients is that, you know, looking after your vision is very important. As well as getting your screening done, which mm -hmm. if they've been already diagnosed with diabetes, it's important to get an eye test. We think that both these things work in conjunction in order to look after the um, patient's vision. Right. Now, I get told a lot um, and ab about um, at, the, at the back of the eye, there's sugar at the back of the eye. Mm. And, and I've seen you sort of explain it slightly differently. Could, could you expand for the viewers? Because that's how we were sort of told, oh, it's the sugar or the diabetes forming at the back of the eye. Yes. E explain a bit more for us about that um, okay. blood vessels. We explain it in that form because patients find it easier, easier. to mm -hmm. understand. But uh, one of the analogies which I like to use in common with uh, when I'm talking to patients is, Look at your blood vessels at the back of eye and think of them as like little um, hose pipes that are connected and mm -hmm. they supply blood to all over your eye. Now, mm -hmm. when your hose pipes work really well, they, uh, they're all stable. They look, we usually try and show them a picture as well. When your hose pipes are nice and stable, they work well, they'll supply all the blood to wherever it's needed in the body. Mm -hmm. Now, when there's too much sugar in the, um, in the bloodstream, then you develop leaks, you know, a bit like your hose pipe. If you've got mm -hmm. too much pressure in I there, see. it starts That's to leak. That's nicely put. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, so I like, I just use that as a simple <laughs> analogy. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah, so when your hose pipes are leaking a bit, that means y your blood sugar levels are a bit too high. They need to be controlled. You need to do things. You need to put start putting in place things like making sure you take your medicine mm. on time making sure you get a bit of exercise mm. you're looking after what you're eating so making sure that you control mm. the amount of sugar that you're consuming within your normal food that you're intaking i'm, I'm glad you mentioned that Sergi, because um i can tell you for a fact um the queen's diamond jubilee trust as a sum of money was given when the queen had her diamond jubilee well she, she gave she got a lot of gifts mm -hmm. and she donated those gifts to be sold for charity and lots of millions of pounds was raised there are four Commonwealth countries where diabetes, uh, in terms of preventable or avoidable blindness, is rampant. Jamaica, St. Lucia, Dominica, and Belize. Mm. And I think, wow, um, th this is terrible. Um, and we in Britain here, we have the facilities. I was in Dominica two years ago, and they don't have all these super-duper facilities. They're only just getting them on board. We have a saying in Jamaica, wanty, wanty, can't get it and get it, get it, no want it. Um, and, and, and I'm encouraging listeners, both from hearing you and Letitia speak, to make sure they go and get their eyes tested and, Very and checked. Very much so. Running out of time, I'm afraid, but it's so nice of you to come in and share with us your knowledge. But I'd last uh, you ask you to leave with us any websites or any phone numbers that we can put on the New Style Radio um, switchboard or, or, or their website for them to then say, ah, this is where I need to go. We're, we're wanting to signpost people in the right direction. I oh, presume you appreciate that. We want that all, yeah, all the more. <laughs> what we like to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so our main website for our program is retinalscreening.co.uk. Mm -hmm. So patients can go on here and they can also see where their nearest screening location is. Mm -hmm. So they can put their postcode in and straight away it will come up with the nearest site. Okay. Um, patients can also ring directly into our program. So we'll put it on the website anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but our number is 
0333 Ah, th thank you very much. I'm going to have to move things along speedily now because of the other speakers, and we're now going to play the thank next you. track. Thanks for having um, us. But yes. thanks both of you, Sergit and um, Leticia, for coming in. Um, and telling us a bit about the eyes and the importance of vision and being able to see well because that's what it's about we want we want to be able to see yeah. and uh, I look forward to meeting with you yeah just uh, our logo is detect protect and keep your vision safe detect protect, protect. and keep your vision safe yeah. safe i like it yeah. very, very well said <laughs> thank, you. thank you okay thank you very much Broadcasting across the city on 98.7 FM. New, 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 new style radio. Uh, welcome back to this special program about diabetes, health and well-being. I'm Tony Kelly, your host, since um, 11 o'clock, finishing at 1. And I'd like to welcome my third guest in the studio, which is, and her name is Vicky Power, Senior Health Solutions Manager of WW. Welcome, Vicky. Thank you so much for inviting me. You're welcome, you're welcome. So let's get straight into it. There have been some technicalities with the songs that I'd chosen, because people were keen to see what my 10 or to 12 eclectic mix of songs was, but um, something's gone wrong here. Typical of live radio, I suppose, so you might not hear them. You've only heard two so far that I chose, but we'll see if we can fix that problem. But let's start with Vicky by asking you, um, explain to us your title and also what does WW mean um, to the listeners who might never have heard it yeah, before. Yeah, definitely. So my title is Senior House Solutions Manager. I oversee all the National Diabetes Prevention Programme contracts we have with NHS England. Across England, we've currently got five, all the way from Cumbria down to Cornwall, but we've also got Birmingham and Solihull, and that's why I'm here today. Right, thank you. Because some of the listeners in this area are from Sandwell, yes. but um, somebody's coming in after you to talk uh, specifically about what's happening in Sandwell in terms of what they're trying to do. Um, um, uh, it, okay, um, and I did say, tell us what the WW. Yeah, WW. So we got, it's Weight Watchers Reimagined. So previously we were Weight Watchers and we've rebranded over the last 18 months mm -hmm. to WW to incorporate the program now, which encompasses losing weight, eating healthier and moving more and shifting people's mindset a while around lifestyle, mm -hmm. etc. It's a science-based program which supports people through the Healthier You National Diabetes Prevention Program. Right. So this National Diabetes Prevention Program, which I said earlier, is an initiative set up by um, Public Health England, NHS and Diabetes UK to look at people at risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Correct. And I did explain earlier what type 2 is as opposed to type 1, with 90% of the um, people with diabetes having type 2. Um, what does this uh, National Diabetes Prevention Program, listeners out there wanting to make themselves available for it, um, what does it entail? How do they sign up to it? Is there any signposting, self-referral? Take us through that process so listeners are clear in their mind as to what they should do, what they can expect if they go on the program, what benefits it will be to them. I yeah, leave that open ended. So it's a nine month program. So the nine months is there to support people in changing their lifestyles mm -hmm. for people who are at risk of type two diabetes. So they can get referred by um, their health check. So we strongly advise people to have their annual health checks mm -hmm. to go and get their HbA one C levels mm -hmm. measured. From that blood level, they'll be able to see if they're at risk of type two diabetes. Mm -hmm. Their healthcare professional then will they refer them to the National Diabetes Prevention Healthier You. They will either send their direct their personal details over to us to make contact, or they'll give them a telephone number, which I'll be able to give you at the end of the program yes, today. Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, and they'll be able to call the number. We will then discuss over the over the phone with them, and the helpline's open from 8 a.m. in the morning to 8 p.m. at night, Monday to Friday, and then 9 to 5 on a Saturday and so Saturday and Sunday to talk them through what the program's about, what being at risk means, mm -hmm. and how we can help them throughout that nine month program. That nine month program supports people through 13 sessions. Now they have to come at least 13 sessions within that nine months. But with WW, you can come as to weekly sessions all the way through mm -hmm. to support you on that. There's different programs, different curriculums, all discussed all the way through to help people change their lifestyle. 
as you mentioned already, it's all about lifestyle choices with, with being at risk of type 2, type 2, type 2 diabetes. It's about changing those life, that lifestyle to either eating healthier, in, in, encouraging more physical activity, etc. And those program, those sessions will support people in doing that. And what the listeners need to understand is there's no shame. Everybody who is in those groups has an issue of being what we'd say pre-diabetes or borderline or at risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Yeah. So it's, for in, it's in their own interest to, um, because I, I'll also add to that, the complications. I start off, because I do a lot of this diabetes awareness training out there in the community, we start off with the head. Strokes, yeah. blindness, heart attacks, kidney failure, meaning some people have to go on dialysis, lower limb amputations, feet being chopped off, and early or premature death. Now, I'll just add, Vicky, for a lot of these listeners are from the Caribbean, in Jamaica. I grew up in Jamaica, born in England, but grew up in Jamaica. I saw these signs from relatives of mine age. I was eight, nine, ten, and I would ask them, what's the matter with granny who is blind, this one who has had a heart attack, this one who has had his or her feet amputated? They used to say, oh, minimized and trivialized or downplayed this medical condition, or they have a touch of sugar. It's just a touch of sugar. And um, I've always known it until in more recent times as diabetes. And it is not a touch of sugar. Some people say, oh, it's mild, it's just a touch of sugar. So can you elaborate on that, especially within the African Caribbean community where they just say, oh, it's a touch of sugar, it's no big deal. So a touch of sugar means they're at risk of developing mm -hmm. type 2. So they're not got diabetes, type 2 diabetes yet. yet. Mm -hmm. They are at risk that means that that can be prevented that's mm -hmm. why we have a national diabetes prevention program so that touch of sugar can be uh, reversed mm -hmm. so people can be then in that healthy range mm -hmm. and the program's there to support people from reversing that mm -hmm. it, there is a genetic um, characteristic within the Africa being community Absolutely. so they are at risk mm -hmm. higher than anybody else mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that they're going to automatically get, get it, it. Mm -hmm. it's a preventative uh, it's a preventative disease. Yes. So I know you don't like that word, Tony, uh, but it's preventative. It, it is preventative, and I agree with you that um, the African Caribbean and South Asian community, um, and it's to do with, as you said, the genetics or their genes or their DNA is another word used, yes. or their metabolism, and also to do with um, some cultural issues in terms of the food we eat and the sort of sedentary couch potato lifestyle that we tend to lead. And African Caribbean and South Asian people, listeners, you need to hear this loud, loud and clear. Develop it from, start developing type 2 diabetes from age 25. It hits the white people generally from age 40, 15 years later. So that is why we need to make inroads. Some of us have children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews who are at that age where we need to be mindful. I go into a lot of schools as well, um, secondary schools, I see these kids eating the pop and the crisp and the, and the this and the that and eating the most unhealthy food imaginable, the pizza and, the, and, and the, the Kentucky and all that sort of thing. And I say, no, 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 more fresh fruits and vegetables, please. And, and they do take that on board. I like also you mentioned health check. Yes. I, I love that. And, 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 and why I say I love health check, most of us own a motor vehicle. And after three years, we take it annually to get it MOT tested. Isn't our body more important to us than that piece of metal, that piece of junk? Absolutely, Explain. absolutely. And you've just hit the nail on the head there when you said that it's from the age 25. Mm -hmm. If you feel you've got any symptoms mm -hmm. or you're worried about something, go and get it checked mm -hmm. out. That's all we can stress to you is that if you're worried, go on to the websites that are available, which we'll give to the end, the Diabetes UK website, the WW website. Go and have, look and see what's on there to get, to get some help and advice. You've mentioned there about the, the swaps that we can make. Mm -hmm. Through the programme, we will help people make those swaps. We've got like, Pacific food lists, Pacific for Afro-Caribbean, so they can make those small swaps. Another thing I want to pick up on there is about physical activity, about that sedentary lifestyle. We will help them 
improve their physical activity so we're not looking at people running the marathon and and doing um 26 miles up a hill we're talking about using the canals the walkways the parks absolutely, around here absolutely. to move more, more to more, move yeah. more it's take movement. in the beautiful scenery that we've got in birmingham indeed. to increase your health indeed and, and and i also must add um sometimes the four key symptoms as we know are t for tired t for toilet T for thirsty and T for thinner. This is in relation to possible diabetes mm -hmm. or at risk of getting it. Tired, toilet, thirsty, thinner. But we need to also stress, sometimes the person has no symptoms whatsoever. And that's also a very important point to, to, for our listeners to hear. As well as blurred vision is another issue and, and, and sort of breaking out in sweats, night sweats, etc. Um, yes, Vicky. So um, we've talked about what, what your program entails and the, the thought of nine months that might send shivers down some to commit to nine months can you elaborate a bit more on that for us please the reason why it's nine months is the about of evidence the scientific proven program behind that it takes a long time for people to change their habits mm -hmm. we're not asking people to go from 100% eating the foods they want down to 20% it's mm -hmm. all about making those small changes those small choices that takes time. Mm -hmm. You can't change someone's lifestyle in a that week, two mm -hmm. weeks. It takes time. But also, you've got to come along this with your friends and family. It's not right. something mm -hmm. you can do along. Yes, and I that agree. nine months is there mm -hmm. to invite in envelope everybody along that journey mm -hmm. as well so that nine months is really beneficial for everybody mm -hmm. not just that person but for everybody that they mm -hmm. affect as well and touch okay the new style radio audience is predominantly african caribbean um within these programs that you have um how do you cater for them in terms of their cultural needs their diet um the language being used that they can feel okay i'm understanding what's going on here etc etc so cultural needs and diet and language and food and so on how do you cater for those specific things amongst the african caribbean communities it's a great question and one of the things that we do is say we've got food lists tailored for afro caribbean so we've mm -hmm. already what we call pointed the foods already mm -hmm. that's our favorite so that's mm -hmm. readily available to people as well what we do stress is that if you're nervous or you want to bring someone along with you, you that's mm -hmm. absolutely fine. fine. Mm -hmm. Bring them along. If you're not the cook of the house, mm -hmm. bring the cook along, right. you know, mm -hmm. and they can also share with you online as well. We have thousands and thousands of recipes from all different ethnic backgrounds mm -hmm. for you to look at and make those swaps. You'll be able to compare your own recipes, point your own recipes and then make those tweaks. The system here, the program is here to help you, help you support to make those small tweaks to change your lifestyle. And are people encouraged to attend these programs in their community or to travel down yonder to Timbuktu or no. somewhere where they are not familiar Absolutely with. not. In Birmingham and Solihull, we have over 70 workshops available all through the day, all through the evening and at weekends. So it's tailored for everybody. We've got ones in the city centre. So if you want to come straight from work, mm -hmm. you can. If you want to go in and be on a Saturday morning, so you want to pop along, they're all in the community venues right. and GP that's, surgeries. That's, that, that, that's good to hear because um, some of us are very territorial or some of us postal code lottery. We think, no, it's too late of an evening or I don't want to go into that area. I'd rather it be on my territory or my, in my space. So that's a very interesting um, um, for, for our listeners to hear. Um, you have any a sort of positive feedback or testimonials from African Caribbean participants who have which you can share with us, the listeners? Yes, yeah, so I haven't got any specific, but what I can tell you is that terms. so far, mm -hmm. through the Birmingham contract, and we've been launched now since August last year, mm -hmm. we've had over 400 people, specifically from the, the Afro-Caribbean community, join the programme, mm -hmm. and it's got a really strong conversion rate. Some people that have been referred mm -hmm. to actually coming into the workshop and joining is over 70%. That means that once they're in, they're really enjoying yes, it. Yes, it's and about, I think it's yes. that nervousness of mm. oh ww is that weight watchers what's it about and mm. actually once they've made that first step of coming into that workshop and seeing what it's like oh, in their like community mm. yeah. now it can help them and make that tweaks they're mm. loving it yeah. absolutely loving it let me uh, put out a specific thing about from a gender perspective men don't do doctors men are not in touch with their emotions men are not in touch with their feelings 
how do you try to engage and encourage and empower men? W women don't have an issue with that, of any ethnicity. But men in general don't like to talk about their health, uh, singly, let alone within a group. How do you overcome that barrier? I think there's two things to that is that there is there's no pinpointing when you go into that workshop mm -hmm. you are there to listen if you want to if you want to stare mm -hmm. at that back mm -hmm. and take it all in and take notes mentally or on a piece of paper you can mm -hmm. there's no forcefulness for you to join that workshop discussion mm -hmm. you can take that but if you want to join in and put your hand up and tell people about your journey so far mm -hmm. that's absolutely fine you're right about men but what we do find is that um you're very competitive. Once they start <laughs> talking, they can't stop. Here's an Absolutely. example. Absolutely. <laughs> and what we do, what we do find is that once you've started on mm. the program, you love it because you'll be able you're tracking your food, you're getting mm. recognition for tracking that food mm. and making those swaps. Mm. And you like earning points. We have wellness wins, so mm. earning points in recognition for your hard work. And we see some phenomenal results, especially from men. Yes, and, and I'll come back to my personal experience there, Vicky, in the sense that for for um eight years where I live, the part of the city where I live, for eight years I had not been to my GP. But I was having the, the, the toilets, I'm going, getting up three, four times a night, passing urine. And my wife kept saying, something's wrong with you, something's wrong with you. I was into denial, 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 like the ostrich burying my head in the sand. Eventually I could take, and my wife has heard me speak so much on this, the nagging, no more and went to my gp and she said oh so you're mr kelly i said what's that supposed to mean we haven't seen you at this surgery in how many years and it then put the dipstick in that early morning sample of urine plus the blood test sent off to the lab confirmed i had type 2 diabetes i wasn't too surprised because as you heard uh, listeners heard before it runs in my family so it's hereditary in some cases it's hereditary a lot of people and then i made the lifestyle changes whereby i do Every week, Pilates, yoga, aquarobics, badminton. And believe it or not, I go to a Zumba class as well and eat healthily. And that's what I'm trying to get. But people don't have to do those um, things. Uh, the person before you also, or the first guest on the show spoke about other physical activity that one can do. So, yes. Um, Quite a lot of um, good information being gi being given it's there. It's all the small steps. And as like I said before, take advantage of the scenery we have in mm -hmm. Birmingham. Go out into mm -hmm. the into the air for sure. Go and look at some of the sites. Those small steps can make a massive difference to your lifestyle. All right. Thank you. Now, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut it short there. We've, we've had a lot of information, too, from you. And you're going to leave your website details. Absolutely. Because um, I have two more guests to come up. And I'm going to try and slot in some of these songs. Um, but... Thanks very much for coming, Vicky, as the Senior Health Solutions Manager of WW, to share with us what you're trying to do out there in all communities, but also specifically the African Caribbean community. Yeah. So our health is our wealth, and we need to take our whole situation of our bodies seriously. Absolutely. Thanks, thanks for coming Thank in. Thank you so much for inviting me. You're welcome. And I've uh, been a diabetes specialist nurse for over 15 oh. years. Um, I first worked at a, as a hospital diabetes nurse at, in Dudley at Russell's Hall Hospital and I've been a community-based specialist nurse for five years and my main role is to support patients with diabetes in managing this chronic condition um, and also to train staff um, within Sandwell to ensure patients are, are delivered the highest possible care. Ah, th thanks for that, Amelia. But so my next question leading on is, how do you involve th this particular um, radio station, New Style Radio, focuses and caters a lot for the African Caribbean com community. So a lot of the listeners are from that ethnic background. How do you involve African Caribbean and, to a certain extent, South Asian communities who are two to four times more at risk from developing type 2 diabetes in order to get the message across out there in Sandwell and the surrounding areas, black country? Well, in Sandwell, we've got a, f a lot of initiatives going on at the moment to engage our patients from different cultures. Mm -hmm. I would say about 80 to 90% of the patients I see are of different ethnic groups, groups mainly yeah. South Asian and Afro-Caribbean. Mm -hmm. We've developed a few um, initiatives across Sandwell. Um, firstly, the National Diabetes Prevention Programme, which is um, gathering pace at the moment. Mm -hmm. That includes um, engagement by Healthy Sandwell initially mm -hmm. with weight loss programs and dietary advice for all cultures um, being culturally sensitive 
And the other um, new initiative we have is uh, from a company providing phone consultations regarding diet um, specific to different ethnic groups from um, Chinese patients, South Asian patients, all different ethnicities. And we also have our expert programme, which is a course run from local hospitals, um, and it's a five-part um, course on, on diet, cholesterol, lifestyle, blood pressure, and food labels, etc. Uh, all the um, expert uh, advice that patients need, really, and support. Right. So going back to the very first one, which is run by Healthy Sandwell. Yeah. Um, there might be listeners here yeah. who live in the Sandwell area, the Black yeah. Country area, yeah. who, who might think, well, ah, that is something that I think wh where we're talking about prevention here, trying yeah. to prevent it. Yeah. How can they gain access or self-referral or what have you yeah. to these particular programs that you've mentioned? That's the that's aim of this program, to make people aware where they, what's out there and yeah. how can they can access it. Knowledge is power. Absolutely. If you go to www.healthysandwell.co.uk, mm -hmm. you can self-refer there um, mm -hmm. for um, anything from diet to exercise programs. Mm -hmm. They offer a health trainer service as well. The National Diabetes Prevention Programme, can, you can be referred locally via your GP mm -hmm. practice. Um, you can also self-refer online as well. Yeah. Um, and um, another point I'd like to make is if you have a risk of diabetes or you feel that you may have mm -hmm. um, a, a, a risk of developing diabetes, mm -hmm. especially if you struggle with your weight, please go to your GP practice and get that blood test to, to get a diagnosis. I, I have to endorse that. That's been said um, throughout so far yeah, yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. good of you to come with the same message about going and getting yourself checked. If in doubt, check it out is one of my mottos Absolutely. that I use. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd like and to prevention is better than cure. Absolutely. I'd like to also signpost to um, some infographics around carbohydrates. Um, yeah. There's some um, online from um, looking at rice um, and the amount of carbohydrate in rice mm -hmm. and their visuals. They're called Unwin's Infographics right. and we can give you the website for that. Uh, at the end. Yes, that would be grateful because um, rice is one of the staple products of um, uh, African Caribbean diet. Mm -hmm. and, and let me then ask you something in terms of a dietitian once said to somebody, um, and she told me, a black mm -hmm. woman at the event, oh, you must give up um, West Indian food altogether. You shouldn't mm -hmm. be eating any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, from a cultural perspective, that mm -hmm. is her diet. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say to a white person, give up your potato or your chips Absolutely. or Italian their pasta. What's your advice in terms of quantities of the various, Af the, whether the yam, the sweet potato, the dumpling, the yam, the banana, w quantities, portion sizes. What would you be saying to the African Caribbean listeners hearing us now talking about this? Food is the staff of life. Yeah. They have to eat food. What would you say? Please? I would say, uh, please don't give up your, your diet. Please don't give up the things that you enjoy. Mm -hmm. But what we need to look at is the amount that you're having. So um, the new advice really is a quarter of your plate. So if you can have vegetables, red beans, um, greens, uh, more peas, um, and less rice on your plate, the, the, ch the jerk chicken is fine. Just look at the salt content mm -hmm. and the salt that you're adding to foods. Then this is the advice I would give. Have Enjoy your food, mm -hmm. but look at the portion size and maybe look at your weight. Right. If you feel you need to lose weight, if you've... Uh, check your BMI. You can also do a risk for diabetes online. Mm -hmm. You can do a for risk calculator. For some listeners, what is BMI? I know, but what yeah. is... Yeah, BMI is your body, body mass index. Mm -hmm. So it tells you what your height and weight is. Mm -hmm. So we know that patients with a BMI of above 25 mm -hmm. um, can get diabetes, especially in different ethnic groups. Uh, it can be as low as 23, actually, mm -hmm. your target BMI is in a different ethnic group. Once your BMI or body mass index goes above 30, or you're carrying some weight around your waist, mm -hmm. which is another risk factor. And that's where the pancreas is, is situated, yeah, just behind the um, absolutely. tummy Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And what we, what we actually understand is that South Asian and Afro-Caribbean people carry more of their um, fats uh, around the their the central the organs the because they have a wa higher waist circumference. Mm -hmm. So what you should really be looking at is, do I need to lose some weight? Right. Mm -hmm. Do I need to reduce my amount of carbohydrate? 
Am I having extra takeaways that I could substitute and take my own food? And could I reduce the carbohydrates at other points in the day? So when I do have my uh, evening meal and I want my um, my, sp my foods that, are, that I enjoy, then you can have those foods. And also looking at some exercise, walking more, taking the children swimming, mm -hmm. and, and, and actually looking at ways in which to reduce your weight would be absolutely important to reduce the risk brilliant advice uh welcome back to um what amounts to the final bit um i still have with me amelia cook who is going to wrap up on um sp we're talking about special features diabetes and good health um amelia can i ask you in your role as a diabetes specialist nurse what other um risk factors are there amongst the african caribbean community which you want to highlight and which you want them to listen to to you today saying there's several um, areas of concern for Afro-Caribbean uh, people with diabetes. Firstly, the fact that they get it at a younger age. age. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing it, it for a longer period of your life. Mm -hmm. And those risk factors are there. Um, hypertension is a, is a very high risk. And this is related to salt intake, especially mm -hmm. in Afro-Caribbean people. The uh, blood pressure medication is slightly different for Afro-Caribbean people due to their makeup of their, their system. Mm -hmm. So they respond better to tablets um, like Ramipril and Losartin. There's, there are specific group of tablets to reduce blood pressure. I would recommend that you have a blood pressure machine at home mm -hmm. and check your blood pressure, um, especially if you're already on medication and it's already been highlighted as a risk. Um, your blood pressure should be less than 140-80 mm -hmm. or if you have any pre-existing conditions already it should be 130-80. Um, the reason this is important is it reduces the risk of stroke, reduces the risk of heart attack and it reduces the risk of kidney changes from your diabetes. Okay. I'd also recommend that you have your annual review check as a diabetic if you mm -hmm. are diagnosed, yes. which incorporates checking your urine for protein, which mm -hmm. is really important because this is a sign of kidney changes and also having your blood tests done, checking your liver, checking your cholesterol, all checking right. your blood pressure. These are all really important. Okay. Please um, look at your salt intake. Please don't add salt to your food because this is quite a risk in the community. And also if your cholesterol is high, please consider that sometimes you may need a medication called a statin mm -hmm. to reduce your cholesterol and reduce your risk of cardiovascular or heart disease. All right, Amelia, that's a lot for us to take in <laughs> and for the listeners to take in. I hope they've learned from some of what you've said there. It's very valuable information. Conscious of time with it coming up to 22 minutes to one and we have a final guest to come in. But Amelia, can I thank you very much for coming in in your role as a diabetic specialist nurse to give to the listeners a take on what, what's out there in the community and uh, all these will go on the website so that people can be signposted in the right direction okay. our health is our wealth brilliant thank you very much bye bye you're welcome birmingham's number one for african arts culture and afro edutainment, edutainment. 98.7 new style FM. now that's one of my favorite songs sung by harry belafonte there's a hole in the bucket and it comes full circle um and it's a, such a beautiful song look at look it up on youtube um, Harry Bel Belafonte's mother, by the way, was born in Jamaica. He was born in America and then went to live for a time in Jamaica. So he's an honorary Jamaican as far as we're concerned. My final guest on this two hour, it's gone by so quickly on this two hour segment of looking at healthy issues within the African Caribbean community on New Style Radio in relation to the, my favorite topic, diabetes, is Dr. Melrose Stewart. And I give you your full title because of the six <laughs> guests who have come, you're the only person who has a doctor in front of your name. So tell us, uh, welcome Melrose, tell us what's your role and what's your function as a senior tutor and lecturer at the University of Birmingham in the School of Sport, Exercise and Rehabilitation Sciences. Thank you very much for inviting me, Tony. You're I'm welcome. delighted to be here. Uh, my name then is Melrose Stewart and I um, a lecturer at the University of Birmingham. I've been a chartered physiotherapist for most of my professional life. Uh, my role at the school is to teach physiotherapy skills and to um, look after the welfare as senior tutor of the students there and the skills are wide ranging but my passion as you probably know is health promotion. Indeed <laughs> I do know. <laughs> 
Um, thanks for that. Um, now, straight away, I'm going to take you upon the word exercise. I yeah. know you didn't form this title. Mm -hmm. It's what the Birmingham University of Birmingham calls it. Um, but it's a word which does not sit well with me. Um, what's your view on that word being used, especially to the African Caribbean mm -hmm. community, mm -hmm. in, gen in a general mm -hmm. sense, mm -hmm. saying, go and do more exercise, because mm -hmm. that's what people are telling them to do. But um, do you have a preferred terminology instead of exercise? OK, so, uh, and I know where you're coming from with this. Mm -hmm. As a lecturer, we have to look at concepts in different ways. Mm -hmm. For the general public, they need to understand that they need to get their heart rate up. Mm -hmm. This is what it's about. Mm -hmm. However you do that, it doesn't matter. Exercise tends to conjure up a gym activity mm -hmm. and putting on lycra mm -hmm. and showing yourself going on the equipment. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's not necessarily, that's not necessarily what people want to do. Mm -hmm. Most people, the majority of people will get active by doing everyday things, mm -hmm. the gardening, the hoovering, the climbing the stairs, the running around, mm -hmm. fetching the kids from Absolutely. school. Absolutely. But mm -hmm. it's getting the heart rate up, which is important. Oh, thank Thanks for, thanks for that. Um, so you're a qualified chartered physiotherapist. Mm -hmm. um, why do the public in general only think about physio when someone has had an injury mm -hmm. and need, and, and all they talk about is, I'm going to have physio to aid my recovery. Mm -hmm. that, that's how, a con mm -hmm. that's how, how yeah. we all yeah. think of physio. Yeah. I think historically that's where physiotherapy came from. It came out of the rehabilitation of particularly injured soldiers many, many years ago mm -hmm. after the World Wars. And so rehabilitation is part and parcel of who we are and what we do. Mm -hmm. But like all professions, it's grown and it's um, diverted into lots of different areas. But mm -hmm. we know that wellness is a very important part of who we are and how we need to live our lives. So as part of what physiotherapists do, do it's about maintaining healthy lifestyles. Massage again, it did start with a lot of um, nurses, in fact, mm -hmm. doing massage. So it's not surprising that people associate it with massage. But it's so much more than that. And you and I know that physiotherapy work, physiotherapists work in so many different areas. In every sphere of life, wherever a human being is breathing literally wherever a human beings breathing uh -huh. physiotherapy is relevant okay thanks for that now you brought massage into the equation yeah. my, my next um, question to mm -hmm. you is I'm gonna let the listeners into a little secret both my wife and daughter regularly have body massages and then sometime last year I went to a fundraising event and one of the prizes was a body massage and I won it. <laughs> and ever since then, I used to laugh after my wife and mm. daughter and say, mm. oh, what are you doing massage for? Mm. Uh, and I am hooked on massage now. I have it on a regular basis. Um, w what's your view on the, the issue of thera therapeutic, relaxing the muscles, mm. the whole issue of massage? What's your take on it? And the difference between it and physiotherapy, or are they one and the same okay. thing? I love a massage. <laughs> so me I'll too. join you on that. Me, me too. Massage is complex. It's not just lying there and being soothed with somebody's hands. Mm -hmm. Massage takes on manipulations. It takes on different ways of treating muscles, stretching them, and lots of ways that people don't think about mm -hmm. massage. Um, the relaxing massage is probably the most common one, lying there, mm -hmm. and also the, athlete, the athletes who get their muscles massaged Chandra. after mm -hmm. activity. But physiotherapy is much more than that. that. Yeah, that's a tiny, tiny part of what we do. Mm -hmm. When you think about the human body, muscles, joints, all the systems that go together to make us move efficiently. Mm -hmm. Physiotherapy is about getting the body to move as efficiently as possible, whether it is ill mm -hmm. or whether it is well. Mm -hmm. So whatever it takes, be it strengthening muscles, mobilizing joints, getting people to increase their car their heart rate right. their cardiovascular mm -hmm. system thinking mentally and of course people tend to think physios as physical people mm -hmm. there is no way you can be a physical therapist or a physiotherapist without thinking about the mental right. well-being of that individual oh. the two are hand in hand oh, so it's very complex that, that, that's very yeah. good to hear mm. can listeners be recommended by their gp for physio on the national health service if they have aches and pains instead of living on um, legal drugs and such as painkillers? Oh gosh, I don't take tablets. <laughs> Me too. I'll share that Me with too. you. Me too. I think I can't remember the last time I take a tablet mm -hmm. because I think your body is great at healing itself. Tab give mm -hmm. give the body an opportunity to heal itself. And mm -hmm. you know this only too well, Tony, it will heal itself. Mm -hmm. You can get a um, recommendation f to a physiotherapist yes. by, by your GP, mm -hmm. but you can self-refer. Mm -hmm. You know, go into go onto the physio website, the CSP, and I'll give you the, the, the uh, website links, later, links. Mm -hmm. and just link up to the uh, a physiotherapy, th physiotherapist on the site. But your GP is probably your first port of call because they have the contacts for the local physiotherapist. Mm -hmm. But okay. you can self-refer. Oh. 
All right, that's yeah. good. That's good to hear. Um, now you've touched on this, but I'll still ask it. Why is movement of any kind so mm. good for the body instead yeah. of the couch potato, mm -hmm. sit on our posterior yeah. um, lifestyle that we tend to lead? Mm -hmm. um, wh 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 why is movement and the core so muscles and so on, why is all that so good for right. us? You know, they did research to show why it is so important. Mm -hmm. Many moons ago, even as a student, I learned this, that mm -hmm. we used to put people on bed rest. Mm -hmm. So someone who goes on bed rest, mm -hmm. within the first 48 hours, you see changes in their muscle and a negative changes. Wow. So as soon as you start keeping still, your mm -hmm. systems d start changing mm -hmm. and will accommodate to that stillness. Mm -hmm. We've got to keep ourselves active. active because our brains depend on it, our hearts depend on it, mm -hmm. every part of our body, the mm -hmm. circulation is all about movement. So we've got to keep moving. Circulation is about muscle pump and getting the fluids moving around the body and the getting the muscles contracted mm -hmm. and making sure that we stay strong. If we don't move, we get weaker. It's as simple as. Thanks, Mel. And I envisage the radio um, new style listeners are beginning <laughs> to do that as we speak, which is a good thing. <laughs> we're onto a good yeah. thing here. <laughs> um, I know we're in the studio and cannot demonstrate as we could do on TV, like mm. Mr. Motivator from mm. back in the day. Yeah, I remember um, him. <laughs> you know, um, what sort of physical activity? But let's say somebody, l let's look at the difference between, let's concentrate on indoor there's mm -hmm. some people yeah. are housebound yeah. and are not able to go out there yeah. and do the walking or yeah. what have you yeah. what sort of physical activity would you recommend for somebody who is more housebound and less agile and has disability yeah. or mobile mobility issues and we have to be inclusive and That's think correct. of everyone mm -hmm. there are people who are wheelchair bound mm -hmm. so they are tied to their wheelchair mm -hmm. for most of the time. We do chair-based exercises. So what if it moves, work it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is what I say. Mm -hmm. So if it works, your eyes, your head, your neck, your arms, if you can't use your legs, your trunk, mm -hmm. you can move those, right? So if you're in the house though and can't get out, there's nothing to stop you moving around the house, mm -hmm. climbing stairs, mm -hmm. time how long it takes you to do a flight of stairs and come down again. You can do sit to stand, mm -hmm. you can do, you've got, everybody's got a television. Most people have got a mobile. There's so many programs that is suited to all abilities. Right. You know, I couldn't go to my park run. I love park run, as you know. I couldn't mm -hmm. go to my park run because I had an injury just right. over Christmas. And you know what? I thought, I can't not do, do anything. anything. Mm -hmm. I put on my computer. There's a program. I can do my abdominals. Mm -hmm. I can do my back. Mm -hmm. And I just lie there on the floor and somebody tells me how to do it. So I'm watching the program and doing it. So there's well lots of yes. options. Okay. Lots of options. That's good to hear. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure listeners are taking note. We've had a range of healthcare professionals on air mm -hmm. today. And I'm sure listeners would like to know from you in terms of what you do as a healthy, well-balanced diet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell oh, us, okay. please. So because I'm Africa, African Caribbean, I'm mm -hmm. Jamaican, mm -hmm. I know that my diet, I love my Jamaican diet. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing I'll say to you. Mm -hmm. But I also recognize that it has to be balanced for me to be healthy. Mm -hmm. And I try to eat healthily. And we've just, we've heard from the dietitian about not eating too much carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. But no, yam, banana, plantain, dumpling are all the things I've been brought up on. And my rice. That's a culture. I will continue to eat those things, mm. but I will eat them in moderation. Mm -hmm. And I will not overindulge. I will not have huge portions. Of course, I'm going to eat more than I should mm -hmm. sometimes. But mm -hmm. that's going to be a one-off. No, <laughs> I've got to make sure that it's a lifestyle. And I stress that it has to be a lifestyle change. Mm -hmm. So when you start looking at diet, yes, you can overindulge occasionally, but look at what you're doing long term, term. Mm -hmm. and try and do something that's going to be a pattern mm -hmm. for life. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are you a fan of the fads and diets that we constantly get bombarded with? And some people even go as far as to say, oh, take a pill. It will help you to lose weight. Where are you in terms of that? Tony, uh, you know, I've just said that our lifestyle is the most important okay. thing. If you do have a fad, it is a fad. That's all it is. Mm. And it might help a few people to get started mm -hmm. on making that lifestyle change, mm -hmm. but it's not enduring. Mm -hmm. And you've got to make sure that whatever you adopt in terms of your, your what you want to change, that mm -hmm. you can continue it. I started, for instance, I started exercising, what, 30 years ago? Oh, mm -hmm. And I s developed something that I could continue. I wasn't going to start doing what marathon i knew i couldn't do that exactly. but i'm going to do something that every week i know that it was priority mm -hmm. and that i could make it part of my lifestyle mm -hmm. so whatever we do in terms of food let's choose foods that we can make part mm -hmm. of life. i still eat yam banana and dumpling and rice but i don't make it a daily it, huge it, it, portion, portion. Yes. yeah uh -huh. so yes. enjoy life i think it's so important that mm -hmm. we do enjoy what we do yes my, my father god bless him he's passed away yeah. he used to say food is the staff of life yes. 
but rum is life itself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't now, know about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't go down the alcohol route. <laughs> but uh, I, I need to end because we're coming to an end now. Yeah. But uh, before I ask you, because I'm going to want you to plug a particular event. Yeah. I'm passionate about it, as are you. Is there anything else you'd want to say to the listeners on the diabetes, health and well-being agenda before I ask you one final question mm -hmm. and play one final track okay. of the 12 I had chosen? What I would like to say is, as a chartered physiotherapist, I have seen the end result of uncontrolled diabetes. Mm -hmm. And it's not what we want to hear about today, things mm -hmm. like amputations. So I know that things can change, They ca diabetes can be reversed. Mm -hmm. And the one thing people can do is, I hear you say it all morning, I've heard you say it all morning, get checked. Mm, get checked. If in get checked. physically checked. active. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to be physically active. Mm -hmm. So I know mm -hmm. that motivation is difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think that's our biggest uh, mm -hmm. problem here, that people need the motivation. Where do they get the motivation from? Well, you've got to find people who's done it, okay. talk to other people, mm -hmm. and just, you know, try to connect with a physio or connect with other people mm -hmm. who are doing similar. Oh, thanks for mm -hmm. that, Mel. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to give you the opportunity to talk about yeah. the Employability Day. So over to you, please, on that. Okay. It's it's very important that we in the African Caribbean community yeah. know what you're aiming for, what you're trying yeah. to get us to do. Yeah. So over to you, please, on that. Okay, thank you, Tony, for the opportunity to talk about the Birmingham Employability Day. Mm. This is happening on the 16th of April at the University of Birmingham in the Great Hall. This is a day for 10 to 21-year-olds and their parents, and it's a day they cannot afford to miss. Birmingham Employability Day is a free event, and I want to stress that, aimed specifically at inspiring our young people in the community. At the event, young people have the opportunity to talk directly to a wide group of black professional role models who are at the top of their profession, consultants in dentistry, business, engineering, radio, television, professors, lecturers, entrepreneurs, and many more. Role models will be there specifically to help young people identify pathways to success. We are surrounded by negativity in our community. This is a day which will inspire our young people, black role models, showing them how it might, they might get that um, success. Each young person have the opportunity to talk one-to-one to, -one to each of these professionals and but everyone will need to register and they need to do so if they're under 16 they must attend with an adult. Mm -hmm. I can give you the link for how people can register yes, but please, I will I leave, new style I will leave radio. that with mm -hmm. New Style Radio mm -hmm. but I am so passionate as are you yes, about indeed. sending out these positive messages mm -hmm. to 10 to 21 year olds in, in our community in because it is so important that they hear this. So just remind us, it's on the 16th of April, April 10.30 till 3.30 right. at Birmingham University. And I know some people, it's the Easter holiday period, they might have a line, they don't have to get there for 10.30. They, they don't. They can come at 1, 1 1.32. But the earlier they get there, the better, because they'll be able to accomplish and see so exactly. much more on offer. And mm. I've done these days before, and I mm. know that once they're there, they don't want to leave. Uh -huh. When you have black role models to talk to and say, mm. look, this is how and you might achieve success, mm. Our young youngsters would need to hear that. And that is also part of the whole health and mental well-being message that we're trying to get. Um, so we're winding up now, and um, I'm being told, I see signs being said, wind up. So we thank you very much, Dr. Melrose Short, for coming in. I'm going to end with one of my favorite tracks. Um, I think it's the fifth one I've managed to play from 12. So those who are listening all from abroad who wanted to hear my eclectic mix of 12, uh, I'm afraid I've only got to number five, but we'll finish off with um, Goodness Gracious Me. It has some links in there about health, so I think it's important. Here we go. Well, goodness gracious me, listeners, that was two hours of talking about health and well-being with a range of specialists, and it's all come to an end. I hope you've gained some knowledge from it, some understanding, and are going to make... Um, the effort. We want people to be proactive, not react when the, the body starts failing you or the illness or the sickness comes on board. Look after your health. Look after your health. I've had diabetes for 16 years. I'll end by saying it runs in my family. I've never taken a day's pill or medication for it. I'm not prepared to go down that road. So listeners, wake up, smell the coffee, smell the roses, but certainly take charge of your health, your health and well-being. Good luck and till you hear me again somewhere else in Birmingham or the West Midlands. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Birmingham's number one for African arts, culture, and Afro-edutainment. 98.7 New Style FM.